my dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Today it is the 24th Sunday in the ordinary time. We read from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 18 verses 21 to 35. Three decades ago, in 1981, there was an attempt on the life of Pope John Paul II. Fortunately, the Pope lived. After he recovered, he shocked the world when he made a visit to Rome's Abibia prison on Christmas Day to see the man who had attempted to assassinate him. Millions watched on television as the Pope on Christmas Day visited with Muhammad Ali, who only two years before had tried to assassinate him. The white-robed Pope and jean-clad terrorist huddled in the dark prison cell for 20 minutes, talking in low voices that could not be heard. When he emerged, Pope John Paul II explained, I spoke to a brother whom I have pardoned. We will never forget the headline next week in Times magazine, Why Forgive? That's a good question. One has been asked for centuries. Today's readings give the reasons. Three months after the terrible attack of September 11, 2001, Pope John Paul II, in his message for the annual World Day of Peace, taught clearly that there can be no peace without justice and there can be no justice without forgiveness. That's a message that has gone largely unheard and unheeded on all sides of today's conflicts. It's kind of like what Chesterton said about Christianity itself. It has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. Today's passage deals with a crucial issue of forgiveness. Surely the most pressing of all our human problems as individuals, as communities and as a human family. The future of humanity is in the hands of those who can forgive. It is important to understand Peter's question correctly. It is not about being wronged many times. A situation which Jesus speaks about in Luke 17.4. Here Peter is asking about one wrong. We are dealing then with a very deep hurt, the kind that remains with us for years and that we find ourselves having to forgive many times over. We think we have forgiven. But when we meet the person who hurt us, we realize that we have to start forgiving all over again. This is the question then. How long do we continue with this struggle to forgive the one wrong? As always, Jesus does not give us prescriptions. He invites us to enter into the God-like way of seeing things and leave it to us to decide how well we can act out of our consciousness. Jesus' response is in the form of a parable. The key to interpreting this message correctly is to understand how a parable is meant to be read. We are accustomed to learning and teaching through edifying stories. In this kind of story, the characters are either good or bad. We are meant to imitate the good ones and avoid being like the bad. It is always wrong to read the parable like that. We find that we identify one of the characters with God and end up with a strange God who tortures those who don't forgive their enemies, burns the cities of those who don't accept his wedding invitation, closes the door on the bride's maids who come late for their wedding feast and so forth. Many Christians have developed Warped ideas of God as a result of reading Jesus' parables in this way. A parable is an imaginative story which we enter with our feelings. We identify with our various characters as the story unfolds. Until at a certain point it strikes us. I know that feeling. This is the moment of truth when we say, I now understand grace and celebrate times when I or the others have lived it. Or I now understand sin and experience a call to conversion. In this parable we see a man who is in a position of total helplessness. He is made to feel worthless. He has neither dignity nor freedom. His life and that of his entire family is in the hands of this king who makes him grovel before he will 
set him free for his debts. He is not a bad man. He has been generous enough to lend money to someone who is in even greater need than he is, knowing full well that soon or later he will have to return his own loan to the king. The problem with him is that his spirit has been broken by oppression. Hardships has extinguished the spark of generosity. Experience tells us how frequently this happens. He has been made to feel so helpless and important that when he finds someone with even less power than himself, he oppresses him in return. The king also is a victim of oppression. He breaks out of this oppressive world when he forgives his servant, but it doesn't last. The servant's meanness defeats him. He takes back his generous spirit and becomes as mean as the servant. Very different from our God. The parable then makes us reflect on our oppression, understood quite correctly as being indebted. What a terrible thing the oppression is. It keeps everyone in bondage, the oppressed and the oppressors alike. It is not God who keeps us in bondage, but we ourselves. The parable tells us that we will continue in this bondage, handed over to the torturers, unless someone makes a breakthrough and replaces meanness with generosity of spirit and the spirit of forgiveness, permanent and unconditional from our hearts. We can reflect on the movement of oppression or forgiveness at different levels. On the world stage, in our, com in our countries, within our families and neighborhoods, and in our own hearts. In each case, we celebrate the people who have made the breakthrough. In our own hearts, what unforgiven hurts still torture us. We recognize the bitterness which keeps us in bondage, consuming our energies, preventing us from enjoying life and being at peace with those around us. We remember the times when we are able to free ourselves even if temporarily like the king. Within families and communities, so often we are concerned mainly about punishing the offender. We celebrate today the peacemakers among us, those who walk through the meditation to re-establish harmony within the community. Dear friends, we are called to forgive and that can be really difficult. You have been defrauded by the banks of your life savings. Can you forgive? You were abused as a child. Can you forgive? You were done out of job because another lied to get it. Can you forgive? The person who has hurt us very badly through their anger, through their abusive words. Can you forgive? The answer is maybe no. What then God want? He asks us to open our hearts to the other so that we may forgive. Forgiveness is the deepest of God's desire on our behalf. And He hopes that we can forgive each other. Our hurts and burdens are heavy to carry through life. To forgive can release some of that weight. The person who hurt us may be dead or may not even know that we are hurting. When we desire to forgive but don't know how, the one way of looking for this strength is to pray for God. We often pray, Lord, make my heart like yours. When we pray that we are praying to be forgiving people, Another way is to pray for the person. When we realize that as God loves me, He also loves everyone, we may find a spark or light of forgiveness in our souls. All of this we may find the will to meet the other and talk to him or her and find the grace of forgiveness between us. Forgiveness sometimes comes slowly. When God sees us wanting to be on the road to forgiveness, he gives us the grace we need to unburden ourselves and be able to love like Him. Sit in silence for a while 
and send a blessing or a prayer to someone you need to forgive. Another best way to forgive the person one who has hurt us is to think good for that person. Not only in thinking but also doing. Do something good for the people. When you give good to that person, you are becoming good. You are already good and you are just sharing your goodness with that person. But suppose when some person hurt you, you are giving back the hurt, the pain, that means you are sharing your badness, which will never promote peace. My dear friends, let us ask the grace of God to forgive. Let us place our wounded heart before Jesus, so that he may touch and heal us, so that we may experience the real grace of forgiveness. To build a beautiful humanity filled with peace and harmony.